everyone, and thank you for joining us virtually for a practical guide to ArcGIS online security. My name is Marianne Ferretta, and I am a product manager for ArcGIS online. And today I have with me two security engineers specializing in securing ArcGIS online, both your organization and everything we do under the hood. So let's meet the team, watch a presentation, and then please stay with us for live questions. Greg? Hi, it's nice to, nice to see you all. My name is Gregory Ponto. I'm a cloud security engineer with the ArcGIS security team. Randall? Hi, everybody. My name is Randall Williams. I'm uh, also a product security engineer with uh, a product security team, uh, and I run our product security incident response team here at Esri. Thanks, guys. Let's watch the presentation. This presentation is titled A Practical Guide to Arches Online Security. Today we're going to discuss the portals information model. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, feature layer security with Arches Online for the feature layers that you create and that you share. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, user administration and authentication options. Uh, we'll, we'll be walking through some of the um, uh, the portal's security settings. Uh, let's start with a brief review of the portal information model. We have users that belong to the to the portal, and uh, those users themselves uh, consume and create items. Those items can be feature layers, or files, or documents, or web applications, there's a there's a bunch of different item types that we support in ArcGIS Online that users can create and interact with. Uh, there's a sharing model in place in that users belong to groups and items are assigned to groups. And users that are members of groups that items are assigned to are able to access and work with uh, those items that are available. Behind the scenes, uh, this information model is powered by a RESTful API. And uh, that's the URL there that you see. Uh, and you'd see that in a, in a debugger if you were to open ArcGIS Online and work with it there at your desktop. And you would see various calls to the sharing slash, slash rest endpoint there. Um, we have a number of uh, web and runtime SDKs here that interact with ArcGIS Online and that are compatible with ArcGIS Online. Uh, these are basically ways to access the information model uh, besides the browser application that we have here. So it's a robust offering that allows us to uh, um, uh, enjoy working with ArcGIS Online from a number of different um, um, uh, interfaces. Next, we have the portal, uh, otherwise known as your ArcGIS Online organization. Uh, so your organization consists of a custom URL, uh, which is something.maps.arches.com. Uh, you have the ability to choose your custom URL as you see fit. And uh, that organization can be uh, either, either set as being public or private. Now, in the back end, if we were to review this resource through the sharing API, uh, we would see that in the uh, in this in this JSON object here uh, that this particular organization is described in such a way as to as to where clients can understand uh, for your ArcGIS Online organization. Next, let's talk a little bit about items. So, uh, items that are created by users in ArcGIS Online are typed whether in a web map or a, uh, a hosted feature layer, maybe a hosted tile layer, some sort of file like a shape file or a CSV. Uh, maybe it's some other sort of data source that's out there that you have or an app. So there's a lot of different item types that you can add to ArcGIS Online. Uh, when those items are created or added by reference, uh, for instance, you can uh, uh, you can reference a feature service that's on a, a standalone ArcGIS server in ArcGIS Online. Uh, when those items are added or created, those items are set to private by default. However, uh, owners or administrators or members of groups that have update access can then choose to share those items out to groups or to the entire organization 
or to the public to access those items anonymously. Be careful whenever you move to um, make an item accessible to everyone. Be sure that you've uh, uh, you validated that you don't have any kind of uh, personally identifiable information or personal health information. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to set up some sort of governance within your organization uh, to assist with making the determination about whether or not an item should be shared to the public or whether uh, the sharing settings for that item should be set uh, either internally or to an internal group or something like that. To the right here, we have the representation of an item sharing uh, status uh, according to the Arches Online REST API. You see that uh, each item has a unique ID associated with it uh, in the URL stem there, and that the, uh, the owner title uh, and the item type there are all described there within that JSON block there. And so it's, uh, it's easy for uh, someone using, for example, the ArcGIS uh, JavaScript API uh, to load an item based on its ID and read through that item's properties. In the examples in this slide, we have a couple of different uh, item types there, including some feature layers there. Uh, you can see on the left the icons that describe uh, uh, who can work with these items. Uh, for instance, the, uh, uh, the little building says that it's uh, uh, scoped to the organization, plus the U uh, stands for a group that exists on this portal. And I think the group's name here is called Update. Uh, the icons that represent just individuals are that those are, uh, those are shared to um, uh, just the owner themselves uh, into a group and uh, the icons that represent the earth means that these items are globally accessible. Uh, we've highlighted the, uh, the, the item type here in this JSON snippet for a web mapping application. We've also highlighted uh, how that item can be accessed in this particular case, this example, this item is accessible to the public. Next, let's chat about users in ArcGIS Online. Uh, users uh, create and own items, and they can create and own group and, and belong to groups. Uh, there is a level of configurable discoverability associated with users there. Uh, so uh, you can set your profile to be discoverable by everyone, which uh, may be valuable if you are a spokesperson for your organization. You can set that profile to be visible only to people within your organization or for those concerned about privacy. You can set your profile to be discoverable to no one. Uh, every users have a profile associated with them. Uh, which again may include a, a thumbnail, uh, your specific regional preferences there and your, your culture preference, uh, the types of units that you prefer, whether standard or metric, uh, and your username. And again, just like other items out there, uh, users can be accessed via the RGIS JavaScript API. And every user is a member of a role. So you can see in the screenshot here, uh, that we have described a couple of the different roles that can be available for the user and the users in this particular organization. You can see here that each member name is enumerated. Uh, the amount of ArcGIS Online credits that have been allocated to each individual user and their usage of those credits is described here in the user screen. Um, we can tell uh, when a user last logged in, whether it was today, yesterday, or a few days ago. Um, the license user type for each one of those users is available in the user screen here. It's under your, my organization settings, uh, and this is the administrator view. And again, we have a number of different options as far as roles go. Uh, there are both built-in roles and there are custom roles that users can create, uh, which we will discuss a little bit later. So let's talk about those user roles. Uh, the built-in roles with ArcGIS Online include administrators, data editors, publishers, users, and viewers. And those are described in the order of uh, kind of privileges that are assigned to each one of those users. Obviously, an administrator is going to have a higher level of privileges over other built-in roles that we have, including uh, data editors and publishers and users, and finally, viewers, which uh, um, are allowed to log in and view content, but they can't make uh, 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 changes to the content itself. 
Uh, we also have the ability for administrators to create custom roles, which are built off of templates from the built-in roles and then have granular permissions assigned uh, to each one of those custom roles so that you can um, move forward with creating, uh, for instance, uh, groups for those who are in charge of working with the, the look and feel of your organization or the folks who are in charge of, uh, of, of licensing. I like to tell people to um, treat administrators sort of like in Arches Online, sort of like you would treat an administrator or a, or a root user on a uh, on a computer system or on a network. I like to advise people to limit the 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 the, the administrative capabilities of users and and prevent and, and discourage people logging in under an administrator role. Uh, instead to um, have users log in as less privileged roles and then only log in as administrators when they need to actually perform some level of administration and use custom roles instead whenever you need to delegate privileges to users within your organization. So here on the right, we see the JSON representation of a username sample user. And you can see how the, 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 the role that the user has is the organizational admin. However, the individual privileges that, uh, that are contained within organization admin are each uh, uh, described individually uh, in this JSON block. So you can see kind of uh, uh, from the uh, application perspective that if I were writing my application and I had specific requirements and specific functions that I needed a user to be able to perform, that the application can check to validate whether or not a given user has the privileges required to perform whatever activity is required here. So let's talk a little bit about groups in Arches Online. Uh, groups contain both items and users, and it's a logical way uh, to to assign privileges to individuals, sort of like the uh, the, the Windows model, where you would uh, you would create a group, and instead of individually assigning users access to items, you assign groups access to items, and it makes administration uh, considerably easier to be able to do that at that bucket level there. So users have access to items that participate in a group. Um, and, uh, and you can have as many groups as really as, you, as you'd like there. Um, similar to the organization visibility settings, uh, groups can be visible to, uh, to no one, where you can only invite people into your group or assign people into your group, but they can't join it themselves. Uh, to the organization, whereas anybody in the organization can request to be added to a group. Uh, or globally to everyone. Uh, so, and, and, and that's basically saying anyone in the public can request to join a, a group there. Um, items do not inherit visibility. So when we state that items do not inherit visibility, when we say that groups can be visible to no one, to the organization or private, that is statement is specific to the group itself. A, an item does not inherit visibility based upon the group's visibility. The item itself inherits visibility from the item's properties uh, that are available there. Uh, so, uh, so, so basically what that means is that sharing is set at the item level, but groups are set at the group level. They're two completely separate concepts there, other than items can belong into groups. Uh, group items can share items to their own groups, or group owners can share items to their own groups, meaning that if you had a, a number of different job functions, uh, all of which are encapsulated in your portal, uh, owners of projects can create a group to represent their project and can share the items that they're creating for their project to their own groups. Um, so, uh, so group owners, again, uh, uh, manage that type of visibility there. So um, um, again, for use cases we have, uh, we might want to share uh, information in a group based upon access to that group and, and, and disallow other folks to access uh, items that are accessible to that group. Or maybe you have uh, collections of material like the, uh, um, like the example that we had before, where if you're working in a project, uh, potentially, you just want to have a group that uh, that has a collection of similarly themed data available to it, to which you're offering granular access to uh, 
uh, to users of your organization to be able to access that content. There is a special kind of group that bears mentioning here, and that's a group with update capability. Uh, these are specialized groups where all members can update the items that belong to that group there. And that's an important thing to say. All members that are members of a group with update capability can update those items that are within those groups. Um, some restrictions related to groups that have the capability to upgrade the items that participate in them. Uh, those, user, those groups can only be created by administrators. Uh, those items and those users that participate in a group with update capability must belong to that organization. So I can't invite people from a different organization into my group with update capability, and I can't update items that belong in somebody else's organization. And this is a capability that cannot be set later. So if you want to disable this, you're going to have to delete the group and recreate it without the update capability. Again, that's, a, that's an option that can't be toggled on and off. Um, so for examples that you might have for groups with update capability might include uh, collaborative editing of a web map or something like that that you're, that you're working with where you're collecting data maybe at different times or in different time zones. And next, let's talk about a very important concept here, and that's uh, feature layer security and editing. So there's some users that can always edit content in a feature layer. And for review, a feature layer is a, is a, is a type of layer that you publish that frequently has update capabilities and, and represent um, some aspect of spatial data. Uh, users who can always edit a feature layer will always include uh, the owner of the item, the person who, who created that item or the person who was assigned ownership to that item. An organization admin will always be able to edit that content. And members of groups with update privileges will, all, will always be able to, to update that. Now, remember, when you go to check the Enable Editing box in Arches Online, anyone who can access that service will at that point be able to edit the service. So make use of groups uh, for, for whenever you're working with editing uh, and make use of uh, hosted feature layer views, which we'll discuss in the next slide when we talk about uh, uh, who's able to edit and, and, and changing what it is that users are able to see here. Um, there are a couple of different options associated with editing. For instance, uh, you can choose to, uh, to have the whole gamut of edit operations, which include add, update, and deleting features. Uh, you may choose to allow people to only update feature attributes and not create new features or delete features. Um, maybe you only want to uh, add new features and disallow the ability for uh, for folks to to delete or edit any of the existing features. It's pretty flexible in terms of what it is that you can uh, allow folks to do in your hosted feature services here. So I promised that we would talk about hosted feature layer views, and that's what's going on in this next slide here. So a hosted feature layer view is a feature layer that's based on another feature layer. So it doesn't actually create a brand new feature layer. It kind of creates a template of that feature layer that has different settings from the original. This is a very valuable option here because that uh, hosted feature layer view can have different settings. For instance, I can have uh, that view to be shared to the public, whereas the original feature layer might be shared only privately or to myself. I can toggle or untoggle editing capabilities. I can allow users to export. I can set attribute filters. For instance, maybe I only want to display certain fields or certain columns in that data set, and I want to disable the ability for folks to see other data sets. Um, uh, feature layer views can have separate metadata options there and can also have separate time settings. So hosted feature layer views can only be created by the owner of the original feature layer that's created there. So this is a very powerful option and it's very handy when using tools like Survey123 where you may want for some groups within your portal to be able to view uh, your Arches Online 
uh, uh, features and capabilities and, and items that you've collected during the course of a survey, but you may want to limit the visibility of, uh, of that content to the folks who are actually filling out the survey there. You don't necessarily want for everyone to see everybody's responses to every survey, but then maybe you do. That sort of depends upon the design of your survey and what it is that you're attempting to accomplish there. So let's talk briefly about encryption in ArcGIS Online. Uh, once upon a time, this was kind of an option wherein we allowed users to toggle back and forth whether they wanted uh, to use HTTPS in their organization or rely on plain text HTTP. Um, newer organizations in ArcGIS Online never really had that option. Uh, older users had the ability to upgrade uh, to HTTPS. Back in December, uh, we took the initiative to globally set all users in ArcGIS Online to HTTPS. So there's no longer an option there to disable uh, HTTPS. It's going to be HTTPS for everybody. And, uh, and that's the way that we, we hope to see the internet moving forward as, a, as, a, as an entity. <laughs> Uh, in addition to setting HTTPS, we also globally set what's called HSTS, that's uh, HTTP Strict Transport Security. And HSTS is an, a, a, a mechanism that's used to uh, make sure that the browser never even attempts to connect to a resource over plain text. Essentially, when you have HSTS enabled and after you visit a site for the first time, all subsequent requests to that site, even if you explicitly choose HTTP instead of HTTPS, will go over HTTPS. And that, that prevents a specific type of attack called an, uh, an, an HTTPS preload attack. Uh, and, it, and it ensures that all information is always sent over the network encrypted, uh, as opposed to there, there ever being an, an opportunity for a, uh, for a, for a plain text uh, connection to a remote resource there. In addition, all customer data that is kept on ArcGIS Online is encrypted at rest. And what that means is that when your data sits on disk and not on transport, like whenever you're making a request and receiving a response back from ArcGIS Online, that data that's sitting in the databases is all encrypted so that were a user to somehow uh, be able to directly access that database, they wouldn't be able to actually read any of it because that information is all encrypted on disk. Uh, and, and, and that's an option that's provided to us natively uh, through our cloud providers for ArcGIS Online. So again, everybody's data is encrypted at rest. Next, let's talk about user administration and a little bit about authentication. And we'll, uh, uh, we'll slide into some demos for configuring some options for your IDP if you choose not to use the built-in options that are available uh, with ArcGIS Online accounts. So first, let's talk about how you get users into ArcGIS Online in the first place. Uh, there's a couple of different options there. Uh, the first option is to pre-allocate your users with a username and password. Um, this is handy because, uh, because usually seat licenses in ArcGIS Online are limited, and you don't want to give everyone the ability to just uh, sign into your ArcGIS Online organization because inevitably you'll have to uh, revoke some folks from your ArcGIS Online organization to make room for those folks who, who actually have a license and need to be able to use it there. So you can pre-create those users with the username and password uh, on their behalf and they'll, they'll change that password whenever they first log in. Uh, conversely, uh, you can send users an email invitation that already contains a username that you defined like, for instance, uh, a lot of organizations prefer to um, have some sort of standardization as far as their usernames, maybe some sort of prefix or, or postfix uh, um, a designation for their, uh, for their organization name or for their username or some sort of other kind of identifier that they use to keep track of, of people. Uh, you can send a user an email invitation without usernames pre-configured and allow them to configure their own identity in ArcGIS Online as they see fit. And again, they is sort of like a like other options where you receive an invitation uh, on online in, in your email and then go to uh, to fill it out. Or uh, uh, finally, if you're working with uh, uh, organization-specific logins like a SAML provider or open um, um, 
or, or, or open ID connect or something like that. Um, if you've, uh, if you've already got users allocated into that type of system, uh, they, they can auto join, uh, basically meaning that their account will be created as soon as they authenticate into their, uh, into their SAML provider through the ArcGIS online interface. And it will, uh, ArcGIS online will then associate your account kind of, kind of automatically to your, uh, uh to your organization specific account. And um, and allow you to to log in with, uh, with 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 doing nothing other than uh, uh, using Arches Online to sign in through your IDP, uh, assuming you've been given rights to Arches Online uh, through that system. There, um, from the administrator perspective, a, a an admin or a member of a custom role that has uh, these types of privileges for managing items and licenses and th and, and and users and things like that. Um, you can go through and and manage your ArcGIS licenses, whether it's for ArcGIS Pro or for uh, premium uh, content in ArcGIS Online. Uh, you can assign user types to the users that are created within your portal. Uh, you can, an administrator can actually manage the items that belong to somebody else. Uh, say someone leaves your organization and you need to transfer ownership of an item or a group to uh, um, to some other person, and uh, you, an administrator can also uh, control the profiles, visibility, and content uh, for for uh, for users that are available in your in your organization. Uh, admins can can disable and delete users as they need to. Uh, sometimes, if there's a leave of absence or something, it doesn't make sense to fully delete a user, but you can disable them and free up their license uh, uh, over time. Uh, remember, whenever you move to delete a user, a, uh, a deleted user uh, or a disabled user can't own content. So you will need to use those uh, those manage items tools in order to reassign content to someone else whenever you've gone to uh, a disable or delete those users. Uh, admins can trigger a password reset for a uh, for, for a user, basically they get a password reset email where, um, uh, where they log in with the temporarily generated password and then, uh, uh, and then change it to the password they, that they desire. And, and finally an administrator or those designated with, uh, with, with a designated, uh, um, uh, custom role can change the role of a member of the organization to some other role as they, as they see fit. So next, let's talk about some authentication options for users. Uh, this is specifically regarding ArcGIS accounts. Those are the built-in accounts that work with, uh, uh, with ArcGIS Enterprise. So these built-in accounts are the standard accounts that ship by default with, uh, with ArcGIS Online. These are essentially basically um, accounts that use a, a standard username and password. Uh, ArcGIS Online accounts support multi-factor authentication using Google or Microsoft Authenticator. And when you configure uh, multi-factor authentication, you need to have two administrators set at least for your ArcGIS Online organization. And that's in case one of the, uh, uh, you lock yourself out of your provider, of your, of your uh, authenticator somehow or another, or you got a new phone, for instance, and need to reconfigure your authenticator. Uh, that's to make sure that no one's uh, locked out and left out in the cold uh, in, in the event that, uh, uh, that something happens and you, you, you lose access to your authenticator for, uh, for some reason. Um, in the past, we said that, uh, uh, that we would recommend multi-factor authentication for administrators. I'd go personally further than that and recommend multi-factor authentication for everyone that participates in your portal. And there's a lot of different reasons be behind that, but uh, multi-factor authentication is at this point in time the single best way to protect your account from unauthorized access. And multi-factor authentication also uh, kind of ensures non-repudiation in your org. Um, it's, 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 it's common these days for someone to, um, to report that an, 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 an item was changed or modified or deleted. And they might say, I don't know how that happened. I think someone hacked my account from, from my perspective, 
that's probably not necessarily the case. Usually, almost always when that happens, it's related to someone sharing account information. And if users are sharing account information between multiple people within their organization and something changes, then it's difficult for us to track down who made those changes, when they made those changes, because there's no sense of non-repudiation there, because if everyone's logging in under the same account, then it's hard to tell who actually logged into that account other than potentially by, by looking at the IP address or timestamps or stuff like that, or something like that, some other kind of heuristic there. Um, so I like multi-factor authentication because it basically ensures that who logged in to Arches Online is who they claim to be and not someone else impersonating uh, another individual there. We go into these types of things in depth in, in other presentations that are offered during the course of, uh, of the UC there. So uh, when an administrator uh, is, is allowed to, they can set the defaults for a, a, for a new user. And those defaults include uh, a password policy. And uh, some of these options that we have for a password policy are described here on the right. Uh, some options include the length of the password that they, uh, that they have, some, some complexity options, including uppercase, lowercase, uh, the uh, letters and numbers that are required, uh, you know, those kinds of things, even, even using a, a, a non-alphanumeric -alpha, character there. Uh, personally, in terms of, of, of passwords, I like to use passphrases that are relatively easy to remember, but that are long and maybe have substituted some characters for, for numbers and non-alphanumeric -alpha, special characters, uh, rather than using a dictionary word there. Uh, other properties that could be set are the expiration date or uh, the reuse of passwords, uh, including password history. Um, in general, whenever it comes to working with, uh, with, with passwords, it's highly recommended to use a tool like a password manager, uh, like LastPass or something like that, to help manage your passwords over time so that you don't necessarily have to remember a complicated password. So it is possible to create a social account with Arceus Online. A social account is an ArcGIS public account. It's a free account that's available for individuals to create and share content, with some limits on usage there. You can create an ArcGIS public account using GitHub, Facebook, Google, or Apple logins. Uh, once you've created a public account uh, or created a public account using a social login, you can sign into ArcGIS and other Esri sites like GeoNet and ArcGIS Story Maps using that social login there. Next, I'm going to let my colleague Gregory Ponto discuss uh, organization-specific logins uh, with uh, ArcGIS Online. Hey, thanks, Greg. That was really informative uh, and really important topic there for setting up your organizational accounts with Arches Online. Uh, so let's talk about uh, organizational security controls. Uh, it's a couple of different uh, uh, items we want to highlight here, including uh, anonymous access, uh, profile visibility options, and whether or not you want to allow users to share content to everyone. Um, so first off, uh, anonymous access. Uh, this option allows users to anonymously access your organization's uh, Arches Online website. If this option is not enabled, anonymous users cannot access your website or your content, and they can't view those maps with, uh, with, with Bing Maps if, uh, if your organization is configured with, with Bing. Um, note that if you do disable anonymous access, members can still share items to the public using the public URL. So it is possible for you to share an item to the public even though anonymous access to your portal isn't, isn't set up. So that kind of helps to um, uh, prevent access to the Arches Online website, while at the same time, if you have content that you want to be able to share to the public, uh, you can do that. So if you do enable anonymous access for your organization, make sure that those groups selected for the site configuration groups are shared with the public. Uh, those are uh, the groups that control some of the look and feel um, uh, to some of that public content that's in the groups. Uh, make sure that those, uh, those are set up properly so the public can view those. Uh, finally, also note 
that organizations that are marked as verified organizations, uh, that's a program that Esri has that uh, uh, where Esri validates that you are who you say you are and that you are a purveyor of truth in the online world there. Um, members of verified organizations must allow anonymous access to the organizations. Uh, if you want to disable anonymous access, you have to have your verified access removed. So again, a verified uh, Arches Online organization account is for those uh, users who want to be the, the source of truth on uh, public content there. Uh, profile visibility uh, is an important topic there. Uh, enable this option if you want to allow members to modify the biographical information in their profile and be able to change who can see their profile. A lot of organizations are sensitive to private information and an organization profile, and so administrators have the option to choose whether or not they want to allow uh, folks to access that content there. A, a new option here is to allow members to download licensed ESRI applications like ArcGIS Pro from their settings page. Uh, you can enable this option if you want users to be able to uh, uh, to download and use ArcGIS Pro. Um, of course, they have to have a license in order to do that. So disabling that option hides that, that download link. And one thing that I'd really like to point out is this uh, members can share publicly option. Uh, you, you can enable this option if you want to allow members to make their profile visible to everyone and to be able to share their web maps, apps, content, whatever, el whatever else they've created uh, with the public or embed their maps in groups or in websites. Um, so if you disable the setting, members cannot make their profile public. Uh, they cannot share their content publicly. And they cannot embed uh, content in, in websites. Uh, the social media sharing buttons are also disabled uh, whenever you turn off this option here. Uh, as an administrator, administrators can always share content with the public there. Uh, so um, uh, so if, you, and if you'd like, uh, administrators can also set a member's profile uh, visible to the public so that that member can, invited, it can be invited into groups outside of the organization. If you choose to disable anonymous access to your organization, you can still share maps, apps, or groups by sharing the item with everyone, uh, the item itself on the items details page, and changing the, uh, the URL from your organization's private URL to the publicly accessible URL, which is just Arches Online with the, uh, uh, with the item details page. This is pretty well documented out there. So the reason why uh, I really like to highlight the sharing to everyone button there uh, is, is because one of the most frequent issues that we come across in product security is inappropriate sharing, whether it's uh, a, a user mistakenly including PII, like personally identifiable information or uh, personal health information uh, or, or proprietary information or, or, or maybe information that's copyrighted. Um, a lot of times people will create those and not, not think about the implications of what they're doing whenever they share content to the public. And then later on, they figure out that, oh, wait a minute, this information wasn't necessarily supposed to be shared. And then they, they have to, to, to work out an incident response plan uh, to determine if, if notifications are required to the public for, for those folks who may have been impacted by these types of issues there. So if you're if you're an informa if you're a, a a provider that deals with uh, potentially sensitive types of information there a it's good to have some sort of a policy in place or some sort of workflow in place uh, for some governance for what can be shared publicly and b <clears throat> it might be a good idea to require that administrators be the ones that do the sharing itself rather than individual users there. Maybe allow users to share within the organization or to share to groups, but not necessarily to share publicly until the information that they're creating can be properly vetted. A newer option in ArcGIS Online is uh, access notices and information banners. So access notices can be configured uh, post-authentication, uh, meaning that once they authenticate to your portal, that uh, they're required to uh, uh, acknowledge a, an access notice there uh, that are basically set as a terms of service. Uh, they won't be prompted until the next time that they log in again. Uh, there's also an option for all users as soon as they access the organization. Uh, this is an option if you have anonymous access enabled. 
And again, this is another terms notice, but it's for the, the, the all users who access your org, not just your or not just organization members. Um, and finally, there is an option to configure an information banner uh, that gets set in the on all pages of the home app uh, at the bottom and the top of the pages, and that's uh, um, and that's good for organizations who might share classified information that are, and are required to have some sort of banner uh, on their on their uh, Arches Online organization, or to make sure everyone's aware of maintenance schedules and uh, and whether or not your Arches Online organization is configured in read-only mode. Let's discuss a specific option within Arches Online. And this is uh, um, the Allow Origins option in, in Arches Online. So uh, what this option does is it controls uh, which domains can, can make cross-origin requests to the Arches Online REST API. So let's think about that and, and understand what that means. Uh, by default, uh, Arches Online uh, allows applications hosted on any origin uh, to consume services from the Arches Online sharing API. But that might not be necessarily the goal of what you're trying to do. You might want to prefer that uh, access be limited to uh, domains that you control or to origins that you control rather than allowing any origin to consume uh, um, from your domain here, and that's uh, that's that's common in JavaScript applications. So so cores requests is a is a common uh, method used to make requests across a domain, meaning uh, from say I host a website on Randall.com, but I have web services on on Arches Online. I can deny or allow explicitly allow uh, applications hosted on Randall.com. To make these types of requests, and uh, that's that's usually what we're doing is 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 making a post request across a domain, like uh, like editing content or, uh, or or changing a user or something like that. And so this is a uh, a, a protection mechanism uh, that helps to prevent um, various types of, of content forgery and things like that uh, with Arches Online. So how this works essentially. Is that a client web browser, like a client application that, that supports cores, uh, makes a request to the web application. And at the same time, uh, it makes a request to Arches Online because the, if, everything's kind of happening client side in, in the JavaScript there. And so that's considered to be a cross-origin request there. And so if I allow the client web browser to use the web application's origin, then that core's request is going to succeed. But if I don't, then it won't succeed, and it'll prevent the, app, the content from loading in the application there. And again, uh, limiting cross-origin requests is a way to prevent uh, uh, content forgery and to limit uh, which applications are able to consume requests uh, from your Arches Online organization content. Uh, next, let's talk about keeping track of usage in Arches Online. So uh, Arches Online has a, in, in the organizational status page there, uh, has a number of different reports that you can use to, to, to check on page views, the summary of your content, uh, who's the largest contributor, uh, how things are shared out, uh, where things are being, the, the geographic extent of where, where things are being um, uh, created at, you know, whether uh, uh, the, the extent is focused on specific areas or maybe, um, uh, maybe other regions within the uh, uh, the organization, you know, all sorts of things can be tracked here. Uh, some of the important aspects that can be tracked here is is your credit usage. What's what what your credits are being are being used to uh, um, to perform? What kind of analysis that you're doing? Uh, you can keep track of the type of content that you're uh, uh, that's being created there. Those uh, those those content types that we discussed before. Uh, we can keep track of the number of apps and who's consuming those apps. Uh, you can keep track of your members and who are your um, your your larger number of contributors there to your uh, to your org, and you can keep track of who's creating groups and who's members of groups there. One of the most important aspects of this usage tool is the ability to view content logs for changes to your organization or changes to your items or changes to your users there. 
So that's important for understanding who's accessing your organization, who's accessing your items, what's happening with your users, that kind of thing. So if you have questions about uh, who's been accessing your content and when they've been doing it and where they've been accessing it from in terms of the IP address and things like that, prior to contacting support services, have a look through your exported audit logs. You can export those out as a CSV and then open them up in Excel and then uh, convert that to a table and manipulate those uh, uh, those logs as you see fit in order to, uh, uh, to understand a little bit more about what's happening within your ArcGIS Online organization. So those, uh, those audit logs are, are critical to having that level of understanding. That brings us to our conclusion. We still have some time to take some questions live, so Gregory and I will do that with you now. Uh, during the course of that time, we'll also provide you with links to an in-depth demo that Gregory Ponto is performing where he'll discuss using Azure AD and federating your ArcGIS Online organization with it securely and properly. Please provide your feedback for this session by clicking on the session survey link directly below the video. Thank you. Wow, that was really a lot of information to take in. Thank you so much, uh, Greg and Randall, for preparing all of that information. For any of you out there who feel like you may not have had an opportunity to absorb 100% of that content, you will be able to access this content later on the platform as well. So you can go through it again if you like. And as Randall mentioned, we also have additional resources that we're linking you to and sharing with you. We will now do some Q&A uh, with our engineers. And uh, if we don't get to your specific question, we will follow up with you offline if we have your contact information. So we'll do our best to hit all of them by getting started with this question, which I'll actually take this first one and then I'll uh, invite my, my teammates here to chime in on the others. The first one is, does Esri have any plans to work with Esri Canada to put ArcGIS online hosted with data in Canada? And so it's a, a question about data sovereignty, which I know is really at the forefront of the mind of many organizations out there. Uh, we did just recently release our Asia Pacific region, which has been really wonderful for folks on that part of the globe. Um, and we're always looking forward to expanding and, and really thinking of different uh, areas that we can go into. I don't have anything specific to share with you today about Canada, but I, I welcome your uh, direct contact to me, Marianne Ferretta, uh, via email. We'll set something up where we can chat. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for now. Uh, the next question here is for Greg. Greg, if you decide to switch from ArcGIS logins to XAML, what happens to your existing ArcGIS logins and items? Yes, thanks, Marianne and Randy for asking that question. Uh, it's a common question. What happens? Your content remains the same. Your can't you the uh, ArcGIS built-in accounts remain present. Uh, when users log in with their new SAML accounts, uh, they'll get new accounts that are based on the SAML authentication, and uh, then their typical process that uh, admins go through to move the content uh, from the old account to the new. That's great. Thank you. Randall, are there any plans to allow service accounts so that an organization can have a single owner for all of its data? Sure. Um, the, we have an enhancement in place. Uh, I'm going to reach out to the individual understanding because there was a little bit of clarification that, uh, that was provided um, offline and uh, so that I can understand a little bit more about the requirement. But the way that I, I initially understood the question, uh, we, I have a, uh, an enhancement in our planning repo where we discuss the concept of, a, uh, of, of, of an alias for, uh, for ArcGIS Online uh, owners so that a, a, an organization can publish under an alias name rather than publishing under an individual name. And that way uh, it kind of helps with the, uh, to, 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 to be a source of truth as I kind of talked about during the course of that presentation there without necessarily exposing you know, who you are so that you can speak for your organization um, as, a, as a group rather than, rather than speaking as an individual on behalf of your organization. Thank you. Greg, if you delete a member, 
Do you have to disable their Esri access if it had previously been enabled? No, the answer is no. Uh, if you just delete a member, they are gone and their access is completely revoked. Simple as that. Okay, thank you. And can my organizations federate access to ArcGIS Online groups with Azure AD groups through SAML authentication? And it looks like that cut off just before I finish that question. So let me finish. Um, can my organization federate access to ArcGIS Online groups with Azure AD groups through SAML authentication? Uh, if yes, what are the limitations? Yes, uh, I would uh, refer to the announcement in the uh, Q&A section. There is a whole 30-minute uh, demo uh, there that uh, covers exactly that. Uh, show we show how at the sort of the end show how to uh, configure uh, a uh, synchronization between the groups that you have in Azure AD and uh, ArcGIS Online. So yeah, that, that is absolutely possible. Right. Thank you, Randall. In an enterprise portal, what does it mean by members can share publicly? Since it's enterprise, and especially when anonymous access is disabled, what does it mean to share publicly? Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, so while anonymous access might be disabled, an uh, administrator of an organization can choose to take an item and share that access, share the access of that item uh, to the public, which in this case would be the organization's intranet. Uh, we have use cases where folks are using uh, ArcGIS Enterprise Portal uh, exposed to the internet, uh, entirely internal, uh, and, and, and kind of questions like that. So the uh, uh, so, so by by exposing to the uh, to the public or allowing anonymous access, what we're doing is we're, we're essentially stating that the uh, uh, whoever has access to the portal can then access the item there. So, uh, so it is it is possible to share an item via the sharing API while at the same time uh, causing the uh, the portal, the Arches homepage itself to be uh, uh, inaccessible. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too at the same time. Thank you. Greg, we had a question asking if the SAML content of this presentation was passed over. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, uh, apologies for that. Uh, the, again, that the content is in the announcement. Uh, the length of the content was just too extensive to an entirely different section. It's about 30 minutes long. So again, please look at the, uh, the announcement. Uh, the uh, presentation you're looking for is also can be searched for uh, securing organization specific logins uh, with Azure AD and ArcGIS that'll come up. But again, see the announcement and I apologize for that. We just couldn't uh, squeeze that much content into this uh, one hour. That's great, thank you. And I had a little bit of a, an audio cut out there. So just in case it wasn't just on my end, I'll just reiterate that you can check out the announcement that we've posted for um, access to a presentation that Greg and Randall put together that can answer some of these questions in more detail. Thank you. And we got quite a few questions on that. So hopefully that that's helpful for people. Um, let's see. We have a question here asking, um, oh, I'm sorry, another question about going more in depth about SAML authentication. So again, please check out the announcement and look at the resources there. And we have another question, is there a way to share an item publicly but not allow other ArcGIS online accounts to find it? We want them to access it through our hub page and not ArcGIS Online. So I'll, I'll speak a little bit to that question and hopefully I'm, I'm interpreting it accurately. We have had a few requests from people about making something available without authentication, so available anonymously, which can only be consumed within the context of your organization's applications and, at the, and, and not have the ability to discover that URL and reuse it in someone else's application that's associated with a different ArcGIS online organization or a different application altogether. So we don't presently have that ability, but this is something that we have heard with some regularity. So I definitely encourage you to continue putting that on GeoNet and other resources if that's something that you're interested in having. 
Thank you for the question. And going through the questions, it looks like we're kind of winding down with the questions here. Greg and Randall, do you see others that you'd like to take from this list and field today live? Uh, sure. Um, uh, if you don't mind, there was a question regarding the difference between trusted servers and cores. Uh, the difference there between trusted servers and cores is that uh, uh, trusted servers really deals more with, uh, with GIS servers and Arches Enterprise implementations that support web tier authentication. And the trusted servers option basically enables you to be able to send web tier authentication headers back and forth. Uh, you, it, it's, it's best to kind of have an allow list of, uh, of, of, of servers that you want to be allowed to send those types of authentication headers to, uh, because if you don't trust that server that's on the remote side, that's, uh, and, and, and those authentication headers potentially pass through like an intercepting proxy or something like that, um, then, then it, there's a potential that those headers might be, might be intercepted. So, uh, uh, and that's different from, from cores, which basically uh, allows uh, cross-origin requests for JavaScript and for uh, uh, geoprocessing services and really, really anything that makes stateful changes across the JavaScript API there. So that's, got, that's kind of the, the difference between the two of them is the, uh, uh, essentially the authentication tier that you're coming from. Thanks, Randall. I see another one here that's right up your alley as well. Um, is there any way to recover a deleted application or at least figure out who deleted this app? Sure. Uh, that's the kind of question that pops up relatively frequently. Um, deletion should absolutely be captured in the audit logs that uh, with, with, Arches, with, with Arches Online. Uh, we, we, we will record delete operations and things like that so you'd be able to track it down. Um, the, 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 the primary limit and the primary reason why I have to get involved sometimes whenever these things happen is if an organization is sharing an Arches online account, it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to prove non-repudiation whenever, uh, accounts are shared. So then it gets down to, to having to, to, to get down into the weeds, into the audit logs to, um, really kind of make guesswork determinations based upon um, uh, IPs and, and, and geocoding you know, uh, uh, and IPs. I don't want to get too deep into it with this little bit of information, but uh, the who's uh, are, are captured in the audit logs. The can we get it back honestly kind of depends for this audience kind of depends on, on how long ago it was deleted um, sometimes we can get things back. It, it's, it's a long story behind why the limits are there. Our official statement is once it's deleted, it's deleted. But unofficially, I can say that we have been able to get things back. But it's always been within like two or three days of it being deleted for reasons I don't want to get into with the little bit of time that we have here. Great. Thank you very much, both of you. And thank you everyone out in the virtual world for attending. Uh, we do have just a couple more questions, but they're quite in depth. And so we're, we intend to reach out to those individuals directly. And please check out the resources that we put in the announcement. Um, and if, if there's anything that's unresolved, please feel free to contact any one of us or all of us directly, and we'll be happy to uh, discuss with you. So once again, thank you so much. Um, we're sorry we can't see you live. We're looking forward to the next time when we can see you live, um, but we really appreciate you attending the virtual uh, conference here today. And um, that's all for now. Thank you so much.